The scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. We're back in chapter 10, starting with verse 38. And a short passage this morning, only going through verse 42. As Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat down at the feet of the Lord and listened to his teaching. Martha was upset over all the work she had to do, so she came and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to come and help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled over so many things, but just one is needed. Mary has chosen the right thing, and it will not be taken away from her. Here ends the lesson. May God transform understanding into action. Feels like a stool kind of morning. If you're new to this sort of thing, stools are more comfortable, casual days where we just kind of chat, at least in theory. I've been talking about a lot of heavy things lately, the future of what it means to be church, our country, and where things are in terms of faith and culture and politics, and the roles that we can all play in making the world a better place. And friends, that's pretty heady stuff. So how about a palate cleanser? We'll start with a joke. A little boy was exploring the area of the church after worship one morning, waiting as kids often do for their parents to you know, hurry it up, stop having that conversation you're having, and let's get to the restaurant before the Baptists. And uh, he was looking around and he saw a plaque on the wall, and he went over and there were names on the wall, and there was some religious symbolism and a flag, and the pastor happened to see the little boy looking at the plaque, and he came over. And the little boy asked the pastor, I said, Pastor, what is this? And the pastor said, this is, these are the names of those who've died in the service. And so we put their names on the wall to remember them. And the little boy got a very serious look on his face as if he was trying to absorb all of that. And then he said, huh, now was that the 930 service or the 1030 service? I promise I will not keep you here forever today, at least not that long. We enter a kind of different mode of thinking this morning with this gospel passage, and so I kind of wanted to clear our palates a little and start fresh. We've been thinking big scale, how do I affect change maybe in a small way at first, but ultimately on a global scale. I feel like most of the messages, both myself and Pastor Alyssa have given over the last couple of months, have had this kind of wider focus. And so I think it's very fitting that in order to shift gears a little bit in our own mindset, we read a passage like this today in which God enters domestic life and we have to contend with the ramifications of that. A little bit about Mary and Martha I feel like I say this a lot. The truth is we don't actually know a lot about Mary or Martha. There are a number of Christian traditions that have existed, particularly during the period of the medieval church. There was this very strange tradition that ultimately it seems all dates back to one particular, perhaps poorly given sermon by a Roman Catholic Pope, conflating a number of women in the Bible with each other and essentially paralleling, comparing, and contrasting. He was trying to make a larger point. Over time, that sermon was essentially twisted and a number of the Marys in the Bible, for example, all got conflated into one Mary. This is why there's some confusion about things like, well, is the Mary who 
washed Jesus' feet with perfume and dried them with her hair? Is that the same Mary as Mary Magdalene? Is that the same Mary who's the sister of Martha in this passage? Now it seems Christian tradition, biblical scholarship, the very little historicity that we have would tell us these are probably different Marys existing in different places. We're not sure if they're historical figures, but we don't think they were initially, at least, intended to be the same person for the purpose of the text. But the fact that we weren't even sure of that kind of goes to show how little we know going into a passage like this. And I kind of love that, because context is really important and it's incredibly useful, but sometimes we need just three or four verses to clarify our thinking in something without having to dig so much deeper. Sometimes it's the simple and pithy thing that goes a long way. So what do we have this morning? We have Mary and Martha, two sisters. Sisters, you may remember, mentioned in different places in this gospel and elsewhere as the sisters of Lazarus, who's raised from the dead by Jesus. So we're talking about the same family here. We don't know where Lazarus is in this picture. It doesn't particularly matter. Jesus is traveling, and as was the case, and he had done this with his own followers, he'd encouraged them to stay in the homes of those whose lives he touched. In other words, don't impose yourself, but at the same time, don't spend unnecessarily. Uh, don't treat yourself as if you're some kind of celebrity. You can live modestly. You can live on very low means, live in the homes of people that you teach, and move from place to place. You don't need much. And so Jesus, kind of modeling this, would travel from place to place and stay with his followers. In this particular instance, and we've probably all heard this, or most of us, many of us have heard this story many, many times, Mary sits at the feet of Jesus. We have this image of a faithful student and a masterful teacher, you know, Luke Skywalker and Yoda, that kind of thing. And then Martha comes from maybe the kitchen or from some other room in the house with her hands full and says, the heck is this? I'm trying to put lunch on the table and you guys are just having a conversation without me? There's some perhaps woundedness. This is how this is often portrayed. And so Martha bitterly says to, to Jesus, tell my sister, tell that sister of mine to get up and help. And Jesus chides her and says, no, no, shame, shame, Martha, shame. Mary has the better portion. That's the most common translation. Mary has chosen the better portion, not just the good choice or, or uh, the way it's rendered this morning in the particular translation that I like. I think it's more accurate, too. But the way it's often rendered in English is Mary has made the better choice. choice. This is an oversimplification, and it's incredibly unfair to Martha. It's also incredibly unfair to anybody who identifies themselves perhaps with this type A personality and who has often heard or encountered this story as a shaming story for people who are maybe more type A in their orientation or disposition and folks who are maybe more contemplative in their dispos disposition. Oftentimes this binary as it's described in the church is the binary between mission discipleship, evangelization, being out in the world, and the monastic life, the mystic life, the contemplative life. They often, by the way, although you may already know this, breed very different kinds of theology, so the tension there makes sense, and this is just one of those passages that's often used to reinforce that eternal fight between those two wings of the church. But the reality is, there's a lot going on here that we can enjoy without completely throwing Martha out and shaming her for the strength and the resourcefulness and the compassion that she's showing in her own way. And more importantly, I think we can do that without having to salvage this text. In other words, I don't think we're having to put ourselves through any gymnastics to read the text in a way that's just more generous to this incredibly strong woman. I lay an egg frequently when I sit in this chair and my phone falls out of my pocket. Now, if we are trying on some level to transcend this binary between the busy worker bee and the contemplative mystic type, or even more nefarious, the thinking of Martha was shamed by Jesus because she was a strong woman, 
That's also a possibility. It's one of the ways in which this text has been read. And because Mary shows submissiveness, you know, she's literally at Jesus' feet learning. There's this, there's this notion then that perhaps there's that underlying piece of it too. Well, here's a woman showing strength. And because she's chided Jesus, by the way, not the only time she does this. She does the same thing when Jesus comes to resurrect Lazarus. He's already dead, if you'll recall. So when she gets to meet him on the road, Mary is waiting back in the wings, waiting to be called on. But Martha comes out to meet him. And the first thing she says is, if you'd just come a few days sooner when we called you, my brother would still be living. So it kind of, given the patriarchal history of the church, it makes sense that one of the ways that we're going to read this is to kind of shame Martha for that strength. But I don't think that's fair. How do we transcend this binary? This is really great uh, essay by Aldous Huxley, author of Brave New World. It's called The Doors of Perception. It was, by the way, the inspiration for the band name of The Doors. A little bit of a throwback there. Um, ultimately, and I'm not encouraging this, but ultimately The Doors of Perception is about drug use. Has anybody read The Doors of Perception? Char, I love you. I just love that you, I love you so much. Yes, yeah. So The Doors of Perception is this, uh, essentially this essay that Huxley wrote after using mescaline as a way to transcend his own ego. It was essentially all the rage at the time, uh, using psychoactive drugs as a way to kind of achieve different mental states. And Huxley had, it's important to note, poo-pooed drug use for many, many years, and then when he used psychoactive drugs, he decided to sort of write heavily about it as a way to promote it. Now, I mention it not because I'm encouraging drug use in this congregation. Um, many of us lived through the 60s, so I don't think I have to encourage drug use among anyone in this congregation. Um, the people who needed to laugh laughed at that. I appreciate that. That having been said, in the essay, Huxley describes what, he do, what are essentially two ways. He calls them the Martha way and the Mary way. The Martha Way and the Mary Way did not become clear to Huxley until he used mescaline in this particular case, although he also described the effects of meditation and some other things as ways to bring about this result. But essentially, it's an awareness that we can cultivate in which we are at operating in certain modes. It's not about who you are at your essential being. Are you a Mary or are you a Martha? Right? Often we kind of do that, almost like biblical characters are characters of our favorite TV shows. Are you more of a Miranda or a Samantha? Are you more of a Chandler? You know, what? There are a couple different TV shows in there. Pick your favorite, but sometimes we do that as if all of these biblical characters are essentially stereotypes of themselves, and we then become stereotypes of them. Are you a Mary? Are you a Martha? Are you fastidious and always working? Are you perhaps a little too much of a busy bee? Are you someone who perhaps puts your foot in your mouth more often than you should? Are you someone who needs to learn to submit, right? This is one of the, are you the Martha type? Or are you the Mary type? Are you submissive and waiting? Which, by the way, I'm not really sure is what Mary's doing. But these essential types, this binary, don't necessarily represent whole people, but they do represent modes of operating. Sometimes I am more in my Martha mode than my Mary mode. Past couple weeks, I've definitely been more in my Martha mode than in my Mary mode. It's not because I'm not capable of being a Mary. I love to meditate. But it's not all of me. It's not all of who I am. We cultivate a whole person over a lifetime. And yet, sometimes when we read these scriptures, which seem very black and white and very binary, we try to fit ourselves into these boxes. And particularly if you feel yourself as being more of a Martha, you're like, well, I'm not meant for the kingdom. There's something wrong with me. If I were just different in my essential nature, I could be more fit for the kingdom. Because after all, Mary chose the better part. In reality, I think we're meant to see this domestic situation as kind of a metaphor for our own inner environment. And we have to make space for God in different ways. The way in which Mary was making space for Christ is valid. She was making a table. She was making sure that he felt nourished and refreshed. 
We do that when we cultivate our own inner environment, when we do disciplines, spiritual disciplines that help us grow, practices that we embrace that maybe we don't want to embrace but help make us a better person. That's work. That's maybe being in that Martha mode. And we do it in the Mary mode when we're willing to be listening and also when we're willing to ask questions because we're meant to understand that Mary wasn't just passively sitting there. She was a student. And she was learning as a student, like, by the way, the men had as well. Are you more of a Martha right now or a Mary? <laughs> Different ways of operating, but it's more of a spectrum, and we just kind of move throughout our lives. A little more here, a little more there. And the point isn't thinking in extremes, don't be that, be all this. The point is understanding that we have a little bit of all of this within us. We contain all of the elements of Mary and Martha's home within our own inner environment, including, by the way, the presence of Christ, whether we identify it as such or not. And so whether we are actively cultivating that presence in a Mary way or in a Martha way, the invitation 2,000 years later still stands. I don't know where you are this morning. Do you need to sit? Is it time to be still? Have you been going, 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 and just need a reminder that your value and your worth are not necessarily just in what you produce? There's value in what you produce, sure, but that isn't your essential nature. Because I think fundamentally that's sort of what Jesus is reminding Martha of here. On some level, Martha sees their failure to provide a welcoming environment for Christ as a failure on both of their parts. And she wants to head that off at the pass. She's trying to be proactive. But Jesus is actually saying, no, 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 no. Everything is where it should be. It isn't you are wrong. It's you're doing what you need to be doing. It's okay. Not everything has to be perfect right now. I'm already here. I'm already here. So friends, perhaps the invitation this morning isn't to sit or to work, but first to find where you are on the spectrum right now. Maybe you haven't reflected on where your essential nature comes from or how you identify that nature in relationship to your own spirituality. Perhaps you're not aware of what you need to cultivate yet. Maybe we start there. That gentle reminder from Christ stands, even for you, just as it stood for them. I'm already here. Be with me. I'm with you. I'm with you always. Whether you walk the Mary way, or the Martha way, or the way in between, it's narrow making space for God. Narrow in the sense that not many people do it. And as time goes on, it seems less and less due. And that's not a shaming thing, by the way. I think, I think our social forces, I think our need to survive means we just have less time for cultivating an inner environment. Wherever you are, I want to affirm that this morning. Just as Christ, in his own chiding way, in a way I think he knew Martha could handle it because she had thrown the same thing at him before and would do it again, I think sometimes we need that reminder that where we are is where Christ already is. Let us make space for him. Let us make space for ourselves, just as we are, just as Christ wants to meet with us. Amen.